aren't we in a pickle, really, to limit to 0.3? And isn't there, uh, we don't, doesn't the Department of Ag need to be pushing the feds to kind of mellow out and, and allow a broader definition? So um, the 0.3% of THC definition is actually not in federal law. The, uh, in federal law, um, they don't define industrial hemp from cannabis, as we've talked about. Um, however, it is in our state statute. So as the Department of Ag, it would have to be a legislative action, um, not an agency action. Um, I believe that the 0.3% um, in you guys can probably talk about this um, more uh, better than I can, but I believe that that's um, kind of an industry standard for industrial hemp because it ca cannot be construed as having any um, value of the THC to, to use for drug purposes or use as a drug. So that's so where my, I think it came from. My question is essentially then a political one, isn't it? Well, yeah, so just, just a little quick history. The, the standard was developed in Europe and then in Canada, and so it's sort of been a de facto international standard. We didn't come up with that as like, you know, unique. We kind of said, okay, this is what's working. And the Canadians and the Europeans have been able to develop a hemp industry around that standard. Now, does it limit you somewhat? Uh, yeah, it might. You know, I mean, is there a variety of hemp that you know has half a percent THC that might be better? Yeah, it might, it might be, and that might be something we need to take a look at down the line. Will we ever see a situation where farmers are growing hemp at uh, five or ten percent THC? I seriously doubt it because you're talking about psychoactive varieties that somebody could pull out of the field and and uh, you know and smoke. So I think that you have to make a distinction there between generally the internationally it's 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 recognized as above one percent you get into varieties that then have psychoactive potential when you're talking about the THC. So, but. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't disagree with you that it might be nice to have a little bit higher or have the flexibility to be able to say, hey, maybe you know, a little higher than three tenths, but it is kind of what, what it is. Yeah. There's a number of crops that have other uh, levels. So something like canola has to be below 2% uh, uricic acid. So it's, it's not versus industrial uh, rapeseeds. So it's not uncommon to have these kind of biological limits, and there are seed certification systems both in Europe, Canada, here in the U.S. That once you've got varieties uh, that are known to have these low levels, to maintain those is not a problem. You can do crossbreeding among the varieties that are low uh, in the THC levels, and you should be able. You know, there may be the occasional. Uh, variety that would be useful or may have some useful characteristic through traditional plant, plant breeding you can oftentimes take something like that breed it into your low uh, lines and breed something that has the new characteristic using standard breeding techniques. Uh, when I lived in northern Illinois before I moved here there was still acreage and some of it was state park land uh, of hemp fields that was left over from World War II. Do we not have any research data on growing hemp from those years that uh, might help us uh, as we look at this uh, new era of gloriousness? Yeah. We, to answer your second question first, the, we do actually, the, the picture that Errol showed of the 15 foot tall, tall hemp plants in Arlington, that was actually a USDA researcher named Blake Stradui who grew hemp in Arlington Farms, which is now where the Pentagon is located in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, he's he. We've actually got his diaries. Uh, you know, he has published a lot of research on it, so we have a lot of historical stuff. And I noticed that uh, Rick has a great book here too by Chris Conrad called "Hope Life Line of the Future." And there's some other books out there. It's not you know super technical on the growing side, but there is a lot of historical information out there uh, on on hemp farming. And uh, there are bulletins. There were. The USDA and others, other states did research bulletins back in the 40s, uh, so that kind of information is available. Uh, unfortunately, there was a USDA Ag Research Service breeding program in Wisconsin, had been here in Oregon, uh, down in Corvallis in Albany, and they pulled it out in the late 1930s and moved it to Wisconsin because conditions were better there. Uh, unfortunately, as we went through this whole craze in the 40s and 50s, they dumped all the germplasm 
So historically, where material was put into a national germplasm repository, there's none of that uh, present these days. But there are international seed sources. Has any thought been given through your organization as a, hemp, uh, as a viable form of uh, sequestering carbon? Yeah, so um, the carbon sequestration is definitely, uh, you know, uh, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a fact. And uh, the building with uh, hemp herd, where they're basically locking it into, you know, mixing it with lime, and then, and then that actually sequesters carbon. And the research they did over in the UK on that shows that there's actually more carbon captured in the construction process than what's normally released. So it's a carbon negative construction process. So that's pretty incredible. And actually, I think that's, going to be a huge market for hemp once we get it grown here. It doesn't make any sense to import. A herd is so light and bulky. It's just trying to import that from overseas or whatever. It makes no sense. But once you're growing it here, you can build homes, you know, and uh, right here. And there's extremely good thermal properties. There's another about no other benefits. It's uh, because it's using lime, the, the mold. You don't have any problems with mold. I don't know if that's a big issue here in Oregon. But I think with your wetter climate that it, it might be a big significant thing. So. Um, so there's some real advantages there, and, and as far as the fuel goes, I just think that uh, the, the, the jury's still out. I mean, there's two ways you can get fuel from hemp that I know of anyways. All right, maybe there's more, so I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert on fuel, but I know the hemp seed, I think, is too high value to be realistic as a you know, mainstream fuel source. It's maybe somebody's going to do it on their farm or something, but then the, the biomass conversion, you know, there's been research, some research on that, but that still isn't fully commercialized, except like with maybe sugar cane in uh, Brazil or something. So we haven't gotten there yet, but there's, there's definitely potential. So seed is a part of the statute in Oregon, um, and it directs the Department of Agriculture to write rules about the handling of seed, as well as the growing um, and selling of seed. So we have um, regulations already in Oregon actually for seed dealers, any, any agricultural or um, vegetable seed producer or dealer has to be licensed by the State Department of Agriculture and that will fall under um, a similar licensing process. Um, so that will be something that will come out in the rules as we develop them. Um, it, the second, the third question, I'm sorry, was um, about potential cross-contamination. Um, and we have uh, OSU sitting on our panel and we'll hope that they can give us some guidance there. Um, because the statute sets the limit at 0.3%, that's one of the things that I mentioned we'll have to talk about. Um, what are the tolerances and, and how we will determine that. And we don't know, I don't think, um, I've seen some research or heard that um, the cross-contamination, um, having two fields next to each other could actually damage potentially both, not only um, you know the THC level that you might be shooting for for medical purposes, but also um, keeping the other one under 0.3, but I'm not a researcher and don't know that. Um, so it will certainly be something that we'll have to look into. Um, I don't... Right now, the statute doesn't direct us to um, have control areas. Um, we'll have to work through that. That um, gets into quite a bit of different other laws in terms of right to farm and, and that kind of stuff. We do have the Farm Bureau sitting on our Rules Advisory Committee. Um, they're usually involved in those right to farm issues, and so hopefully they can advise us as well on that. It's typically done in a, in a situation like this is there are generations of seed that are produced. So you start with something called breeder seed or foundation seed, and there would be very specific isolation requirements for where that seed could be grown. And then as you go through the generations, those tend to ease up a bit. But oftentimes the commercial crop is not uh, harvested for subsequent seed use. And so you could have what would be called foundation registered seed. The certified seed would be sold, commercially produced. So even there, if there were some small level of contamination, uh, it's not going to carry into the next generation of the crop. But we'd have to figure out what are the isolation distances that you need to have. And then it would be up to those people to work with their neighbors to make sure if they're producing early generation seed that they didn't have medical marijuana uh, in those areas. 
to try to keep the, the THC under control.